Uh, hey, everybody. I want to be real honest. This is like my ninth take doing this thing, so wish me luck. Thank you for joining me for my podcast, The Ingle Angle. I am Fort Worth Star-Telegram columnist, Mac Ingle. And if I haven't said it before, I want to say it now. I love all of you. And I mean that. I do mean that. Because the podcast game has like 80 billion podcasts. And for anybody to stop down and listen to my podcast for a minute or two or 10, I don't think they for I don't take that for granted. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you very much. I think you're going to want to listen to this one today, as well as the other ones as well. Uh, my guest today for this episode is someone I've known for about 20 years. And the reason I asked him to join me for this one is because I think he had a career that never received its, its due credit. He comes from the world of hockey, and he started his career from his hometown in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. He eventually became one of the best players in the history of the University of Michigan. Now, for those of you who are a little unfamiliar with the world of college hockey, Michigan is one of the best programs historically uh, in that sport. This guy would eventually become a fifth round draft pick of the Dallas Stars in 1994, and he made the big stars roster in 2000. He would go on to play 11 years in the National Hockey League. He was an all-star multiple times and was picked to join Team Canada for its Olympic team in the Winter Olympics in 2006. In his first season as the Dallas Stars' number one goalie in 2002 and three, he would set the NHL record for lowest goals against average by a goalie in a single season with a minuscule 1.73. That is an absolutely insanely low number. In his career, he also did something that very few, very few pro athletes can ever say they did. He changed the game and he changed the rules. The way this guy played goalie, and specifically the way he handled the stick and the puck, forced the NHL to change the rules and add more lines to its sheet of ice. He's a husband, he's a father of three. He is also living the dream of every Canadian with his own beer label. He survived multiple years as the backup to the Mercurial at Belfour. He is the one and only Mr. Marty Turco. Marty, how old are you now? 47. 47. Okay. So you played until you were 35. And one thing I hear a lot of former players say about the current state of whatever sport that they used to play. So it's, it's, I hear it a lot in football. I certainly hear it a lot in basketball. I don't know if I hear it as much in hockey, but I'll hear the player from a previous generation say, oh my God, the game's so much easier now. It's a joke. If I played today, I would kill it. But <laughs> I hear it all the time. You played for a long time, like 11 years, uh, three great teams, won a, won a medal with Team Canada in the Olympics. So when you watch today's game and the current state of goalies in the NHL, do you look at it and say, oh, my God, these guys have it so easy. It's a joke. I would kill it if I played in the NHL right now. I was a pretty confident guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty, and, uh... pretty confident guy. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah, yeah, and um, and my my son would, you know, I'm always like, oh, I'll wax you, man. If, if my hip was feeling good, I'd crush you. But no, man, I don't know who would say that. That's crazy. I mean, hey, I don't even know if I'd get a look. I was getting heartburn in 1993, getting recruited to Michigan Red. Parents and my coach, he was like, um, you know, hey, my scouts or my buddies, NHL scouts are saying you need a big goalie. This is 1993. So, you know, when I came to the league, I was average to probably just above average height. You know, we had some small guys. And then today, just on size alone, no, um, the way they played the game. But um, I got the good fortune of being around the game still, working for uh, Glardy and Brad Alberts and the Stars and get down to the game. And every once in a while, I sit on the glass. And I'm, I, uh, it is so fast. It is so fast. And I know it's probably just a tick faster um, you know, from my prime, I'd be able to hang in there a little bit, but I wouldn't kill it. I'll tell you that I wouldn't get in there and kill it. I could probably survive for uh, 30 minutes with some fortunate bounces, but uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm of this, I'm of the book, uh, the school that says um, I've been there, done that really proud of it and had a great time. It's time to move on. Uh, you were part of that generation of goalies where 
town evaluators recognized, wait a minute, why are we putting our worst athletes in net? We should be putting our best athletes in net. And not only that, big, big guys. When do you remember seeing that that generation of guys, guys like Mike Smith, Mike Smith was a big, Mike Smith was a really big guy, but these guys who weren't like six foot one, six foot two or five foot 11, but six, four, six foot five guys coming in who could do everything. When was Mm that? I don't know. It just kind of creeped in over time. And I think it went from anomalies to mainstream uh, relatively quick and, uh, I certainly don't remember growing up saying, hey, let's find the best athlete to play in that. It was just more of, you know, I liked it. And Kevin Weeks in Toronto liked it. And, you know, he's a bigger goalie back then. And, and then Mike Smith came along. But uh, the first time I'd really seen it, I've seen I've seen some big guys. and Everybody's big to me growing up. I was, wasn't even five feet going to high school. And, you know, I had to, like, catch pucks over my head that were going in the net, standing up, no less. And, and when I went to Michigan on a recruiting trip, and Steve Shields, you know, was about to be the all-time winning goalie college hockey history and uh, All-American, and, and he was six foot four from North Bay, Ontario. And that was the first time, because he played even a little more upright. I mean, old school, stacked the pads, and not much style going on. But uh, he, was, he was a big guy, and he was a good athlete. And um, that was one of the first times I was like, man, every time you make a step, you know, and, and whatever – league age group uh, but from going from junior to college especially a prominent school like michigan and seeing this guy i was like all right man i look at you know my now wife and then girlfriend kelly i'm like all right this is gonna get harder every everywhere we go but uh it just kind of eased in and i mean a dude did, just in the last couple of years around here you know we had ben bishop six foot seven heck of an athlete yeah. and to our current young superstar, you know, Ottinger, Otter's 6'5", and these guys move fantastic. I, I, really, it's only just jealousy because they, they don't have to move as much. They don't have to play as high. Um, I mean, I love it when 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 Jake challenges personally, but uh, these big guys are athletes, and so I don't know if it's been a, you know, it was like, hey, let's go find them and throw it in there and change the whole game, but I think it just became a, uh, a little more, a little better evolution. So you spent 11 years in the NHL. At nine with the Stars, went to Chicago for a year. Then you're in Boston for 2011 and 12 when you were 35. Uh, did you know you were done in that final year? No. Oh, I, during the year, yeah, I felt like it. I was playing in Austria, actually, for the Red Bulls. And, um, you know, one point um, I was, we were living at the Lake House in Canada, Doing TV in Toronto, I was I was I was happy, you know. I was thirty six years old, and I was like, man, that was an awesome run, you know, for not playing until twenty five. But that last year in Austria, we went and won a European Championship with Pierre Paget as my coach, no less. Is was a whole two or three chapters in the book. And um, uh, anyway, we won, and then it went back to Canada. I hadn't talked to any NHL teams um for a while and then Red Bull called again I was like you know like I'm good anyway they kept calling so much and they made me Red Bull athlete that I my wife and I were like we gotta go (laughs) and they they uh, talked you into it they did well they paid me into it and um (laughs) and then and then while I was there I took a rask got her with the Bruins and then went back to play for them with Tim Tim Thomas and I were the goalies and uh, Shirelli's is like, hey, listen, we want, really want to win our division and can't play Tim at your, your guys' age, you know, every game down the stretch. And so then I was like, all right, sweet. And, and other than, you know, eroding skill set, um, I was still talking pretty heavy to a couple of teams, in particular the Canucks. But we were going into that 2012 lockout and um, yeah. there's a lot of uncertainty. And so they had Luongo and Schneider and – He's like, well, we're going to trade Louie. We just can't because nobody knows what the new cap's going to be. And we'd love you to groom Schneider. And then I was like, well, that's a great fit, right? You know, be a mentor for a kid for this could last for a couple of years and get never get, you never know, get another crack to play the playoffs or something. But anyway, that August with the looming lockout, living at the lake house, I was like, you know what? That was fun. 
get back. I miss Texas. Let's get back to Texas. And so we started life ever after right then. Were you ready for it? Were you ready for that transition from going from being a full-time professional athlete to not? Mm, the real answer is no. Um, you know, I, I, I was, I was looking forward to retirement. I knew it, you know, talking to my Michigan buddies and even other hockey guys, like things that they're doing. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't have a succession plan, but um, the real answer is no, no. And then the answer is, I think, no for anybody. It'd be really rare for someone to be that smart, that dialed in, that ready mentally, physically for retirement. And it's not easy. It's not easy in anybody. Uh, there's something that bothers me about your career, and I don't think you get enough credit for your single season goals against average record in 2002 and three, when it was a 1.73 GAA. That's an insanely low number. And granted, the, the league, the way the game was played, the way the game was officiated, all of it, the rules, it's totally different now. Do you think because it's a 1.73 goals against average. People just don't want to acknowledge a record like that because it's not, it's not high scoring. It's, <laughs> it's like, it's not a home run. It's not 50 goals. It's not Ovechkin. It's 1.73. Well, that's not, that's not exciting. That's not sexy. And I right. always thought that people didn't, you never got enough recognition for that. Your years were 20 years removed from that, Marty. Did you ever look back and say, you know what? I, I don't know if I got like, because you, you're not a self promoter at all, but did you ever feel like, well, why didn't that get it to do justice, or do you think it did? Uh, I mean, living in Dallas, right? We were still a C market, even though we we're uh, fresh, wow. pretty fresh on the heels of uh, the ninety nine ninety nine team. You know that that did hurt. Um, you know, you got to take the good with the bad in terms of just everyday life, but specifically to the question. Um, you know, even in that era, you know, 1.72 with a new coach, you know, that was Tippett's first year, my first year as a starter. And I think what the, the, the I don't know. I mean, you, and you couple it with the 932 save percentage, second highest ever recorded. And only only the, the man himself, Dominic Hasek, you know, he was one setting records in Buffalo with getting a gazillion shots. Seemed like the whole season he was just under attack. Um, so th those numbers were really off the charts. Uh, had a had a 16 game absence for a high ankle sprain. I really think I missed 19 games my whole career, uh, and 16 was because of that. Uh, another one I was not sick, but they told me to stay home because my a kid was sick. And so I don't know. Maybe that 16 game high ankle sprain kind of diminished it a little bit. But uh, I don't know. For me. It was a, a remarkable year uh, for so many reasons. And, and you know, I think from my storytelling perspective, the, the best is that, you know, the Stars Army picked up my option going into that year. <laughs> you know, we, we argued a few years earlier uh, about a third-year option. It really wasn't much of an argument. I just like, yeah, I was getting ready to sign a deal. Never played a game in the NHL all one way. And he was adamant that the third year was a team option. I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. And he picked it up for that year. And then that ended up having that monster year with those numbers. And uh, we had a great team. So uh, there's a lot of things that went into that year. Um, and the high ankle sprain kind of spoiled us. You know, we didn't win the Jennings. Like 1.72 goals against, and you don't win the Jennings. Um, you know, Tugger was, was – had to play those 16 games and things didn't go great for us. Um you know, could have could have won the president's trophy too. You know, you know, you kinda you never know. So I think there's a few things uh surrounding the whole deal and living here in Texas and playing out here. You know, we you know kind of lost the shuffle on, on a lot of times, you know, just our national games alone uh proved that to be on TV. So um then then not didn't bother me. I know what kind of year we had. So it was it was a great springboard for me, uh from a career perspective, contractually too. Um, just put me there, but I was, I was also 27 years old and that was my first crack at being a number one and not playing a game until I was 25, uh, being game one. I was like, honestly, this is, this is all gravy and I don't want it to go away. And, and I worked my butt off to stay healthy, to stay, 
you know, in the net and, um, you know, play 60, 70 plus games a year for the foreseeable future. Uh, that season, you guys went into the last game of the regular season. You had the record. And I remember there was a lot of anticipation and suspense in the building about, uh, and I remember Dave Tippett saying, we're playing for a president's trophy. You you needed to win that game to, to have a shot to be the number one, the number one seed basically going into the playoffs, whether it's East or West. Was there ever any discussion because of your record, like pulling the, like the Ted Williams going into the last game of the regular season, whether or not he's actually going to try to protect 400 or not? Was there ever any discussion about saying, Marty, we're going to sit you down to protect that record? No, not with me. I think they they knew they knew me. And there, and there was also other circumstances, right? Coming off a high ankle sprain. Yeah. That that was brutal and was still painful. And I just needed to learn to deal with it and play these games. Um, you know, hockey players. I mean, I grew up thinking of, you know, gold medals and Stanley Cups and Stanley Cup playoffs was around the corner, my first kick at the can. I I I want to play. So they they knew that. And you know, I think the sun the fun side story uh, for me personally is that 1.77 was the record held by Tony Esposito and Tony, you know, grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, like I did with my dad and his brother, Phil, two hall of famers. And, you know, I, I don't know if I was carrying a one seven, six or one seven five or whatever it was going that last game, but um, there was no discussion and I don't think we would have had it. And they knew me. I was like, if I could, care less about a I could care less about a record to be honest and and you know back to the confidence thing right it's like well let's lower this puppy and we did <laughs> and we got to shut out in the last game of the year and and uh rolled into the playoffs and um uh, you know really I, th- I feel like I only got either three or four games with my high ankle sprain going into the playoffs so that that was really the probably the biggest thing plus you know I mean the team first and foremost and just uh, ending the season on a win and uh, just kind of get our confidence back too. Cause there was a, you know, those 16 games were kind of tarnished our image a little bit the kind of season we were having. For sure. Uh, you know, there's another thing about your career that I don't think you get enough recognition for is that I, and I'm sure people may debate me about this, but I'm convinced you changed the rules because you were so good and adept at handling the puck and passing from behind the net. And you basically acted like a third defenseman and how many four checks you killed by going into the corner or going behind the net. And it created a, a real dilemma for the NHL, which was desperately trying to infuse scoring into the league and guys like you made it even harder. Mm-hmm. So then they come up with the new rules behind the net. They put those the, those two new lines in it, so you can't go to certain places. Uh, did you feel that the end? I don't think I don't even know when I covered the team if I asked you this. Did you feel like that rule was put into place because of you? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I mean, it was because I took the flock. I mean, I talked to Gary and Bill about it. Um, Bill Daly you- talked to you about it. Well, I was the player rep for the PA. Oh, okay. Okay. So I was at those, I was at a lot of meetings with these guys and, you know, looking back, I was like, hmm, should, should I sue them? What if, what if, what would that look like? And, you know, Martin, Martin Berdur, he, he, he did, he did a lot of his work above the goal line uh-huh. and he had a, I mean, I played with him. He had a great pass. He, his bomb was great, very accurate. Um, but he also played it traditionally. Yeah. And so he didn't have the, the, um, you know, the dexterity and the form that I created by changing the hand position over the top that I could, you know, move the puck side to side, backhand, forehand, on the glass, on the tape and uh, in traffic and stuff. And not only that, I would put myself out there. And even though hitting from behind is illegal, I would just turn around, you know, and my big goalie butt and, uh, and you know, just give myself an extra time and space to move it over to Sidor, Hatcher, Zubov, Daly, you name it, and to these guys, and there's nothing they could do, and they were mad. And you know, all I said to 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 the brass and the NHL is like, okay, you you're taking away me going in the corner. There's no nobody else in this game. There's no three point line in our game. So other than offsides, I'm gonna have to tiptoe around this line, and you guys are gonna call these chintzy penalties. I said, so what you're encouraging these coaches to do now when playing us is like chip it into that corner and go get it. So you guys 
this is what we're doing. We're going for a dump, a soft dump, and this is creating offense. And I said, I'm creating offense by giving the puck away, getting out there and creating energy. And now we're moving it up there and creating offense for our own team. And I'm like, I said, there's not that many guys to do this. And I, I'm currently, you know, sitting here in 2023. I don't know the last time they called a penalty in the NHL for someone a goalie touching it inside that zone. I think the whole thing's stupid. It should just be abolished. It was dumb then. And it took away a skill set for mine, but um, not totally. But there's times when, you know, I would have raced out there and got it and fired it up there. They're changing or in the second period. Um, but, you know, I got stuck in that stupid, stupid zone. So, you know, that does – you know, I think the credit, you know, look, you know, getting this far removed, I think the credit that, you know, I, I care the most about and, or I jokingly say in social media or sitting here watching games on the TV, you know, watching goalies get outside the net, put their hand over the stick and they make a nice hard, clean pass up to their teammate. I just like, I've always say, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so, yeah. You know, I might not know who did that. Who, uh, why, why are we going in the world's doing it, but you're welcome. So my first, uh, your first year starting, um, I never told you this. I, I learned something from you. I was always, I, I applied it to my own life. Uh, your first year playing, you got into a fight or a skirmish or a scrum or whatever with a player from the St. Louis Blues. I don't remember his name. You'll remember it. Uh, so he comes out and he basically calls you out after the game to the St. Louis media. This is before the internet and stuff. So we don't see it for a few days, uh, the people in Dallas Fort Worth. And then I see it. And then we go to you after a game. You weren't even starting the game. So you were kind of surprised that we had walked up to you to, to ask you about it. And you owned it. You owned it. You said, yeah, he was right. That you were owning whatever the mistake was. It was no big deal. It wasn't a big deal. But I remember just I was just dumbfounded that this professional athlete would sit there and own a mistake. It just it's just not in many DNAs to, to sit there and say, Yeah, I, I messed up. It was a flaw. And he was, he was probably right. I think he was telling you were talking too much or trying to be too clever with your stick. Do you remember that at all? Yeah. And it was uh, I want to say Craig Berube, but he's the coach there now. What uh, Craig Berube? No, it was. But you remember uh, the incident on the ice? Oh yeah, well, I, I had a beer, I had a beer with him in Calgary. Actually. That was right. Yeah, and and yeah. you and that was written about in Sports Illustrated. You you did an interview yeah. with Michael Farber about that, but you owned uh, it. But you owned it, Marty. And it's, it's it's coming to me. Well, I mean, th think of this, Mac. Like. You know, even though at the NHL level, you're playing 82 games a year or, you know, you're on the bench, you're playing it in those 82 games. My life, my life's built around mistakes. And, and if you harbor those feelings and you don't own up to them, good and bad, you know, I'm screwed. And so I, I'm very fortunate to have a personality trait inside me that, you know, probably is on the better side of, you know, how you build a goalie, um, you know, a lot of attributes, you would be like, no, this guy should not be a goalie. <laughs> but that was one that just came really easy and natural to me. And, and it doesn't mean you're not competitive or, you know, something doesn't bother you. Yeah, it bothered the crap out of you. But she's just a really innate ability to, to, you know, make a mistake, internalize it, understand he probably shouldn't be doing that. And, and, you know, there's times I defended myself for sure when I was blatantly wrong, you know, whether it was a bad goal or penalty that I took or, you know, other things uh, off the ice. And so, um, you know, by that point I was, you know, probably getting close to 30 years old and, um, you know, lived a pretty real life. And we didn't have time to kind of mince words and pretend we were something that we weren't because, as a team and as a goalie, man, we felt pretty good about our chances of winning. And so those things just, they don't, they don't help your cause. And, uh, you know, there's was times earlier in my life where I wouldn't own it. And, you know, then I would regret it because it would, you know, detract from anything I was doing mentally. And my game was all mental. There was times where I couldn't do things just because, um, you know, I thought it would take away from my focus and just, for the goalie that I was, I, I know I needed to do everything I could to be hundred percent committed every day, every game, or else it would just erode at my, my confidence um, because I wouldn't feel like I was all in. And that's kind of my style being all in. And so, so a moment like that was, 
you know, it was probably nothing for me because uh, owning owning it every night was something I had to do on a regular basis. So uh, you, you talk about goalie personalities, and you're right. You were kind of the outlier for a long time. I I, I can't speak to it as much now, but yeah, you <laughs> you replaced a true original in Ed Belfour. Everybody has an Ed <laughs> Belfour story. Uh, I have to ask you, what's your favorite Ed Belfour story? Uh, that's a good one. Trying to see which one I'll take out of the take out of the rabbits out of the hat. Um, you know. Yeah, he was he was on one hand so good to me, you know. When during was he really run, during the cup runs? Yeah, I wasn't his backup. Oh, okay, you know, he was great. I remember after winning the cup, we were over at Lone Star Bar, and you know, he's just like, man, you you got the world ahead of you. You know, he just won the cup. He's being real nice, and and uh, it was late night. He's like, you have to you got so much potential. Just keep going. Just make sure you have respect and tr- trust this game. And and then you know, years later, he went talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, literally one year, he would, didn't say a word to me for the whole season, and he would. Uh, when you were his backup, he wouldn't even acknowledge you. The one, the one year, yeah, he he moved my, he moved my equipment over, um, so he couldn't <laughs> look at me. Rob DeMaio had to sit in a goalie stall the whole year, uh, so it was it was pretty funny. But you know, Ed, Ed I mean, I we Ed and I still talk, and uh, I'm really proud of stuff he's doing, um, and he's and he's doing great. He, you know, the one specific story that I'll. I'll think of it doesn't get enough credit from uh you know hardy worked off the ice from the skates his equipment and he developed he developed the skates that guys use today and i don't think most people know this one so he he was the first one to have interchangeable blades and i'm playing with him i don't even know he's getting interchangeable blades and obviously steve sumner does and you know we use skates and not to bore you too much with it but you know every time you're sharpening right you're taking a little steel away and after you know, a couple of weeks of sharpening it three, four times, you kind of get down near the end. Well, you got to change the bottom of the skate. Well, you can't just pop the blades in and out like they can now. And so you get closer to the plastic. And when you lean over, right, you get closer to that plastic and you start hitting the plastic and your feet would slide from under you. And so I love my boots. So poor Suds, you had to take the rivets out of the bottom of the skate, put a whole new plastic mold on it just to get new steel. Well, Eddie designed, helped design a system that you could pop your blades out so i was bitching one day to sudsy and sudsy's like hey why don't you go ask daddy he's got these new things and so one day i was like um you know talking to ed and hitch was having a long powwow meeting and so i'm like hey Ed, you know this man i I gotta keep replacing my my cowlings and my steel gets low and he's listening to me he's listening to me and you know i did a lot more talking than he did obviously and um he, he looks at me he's like try ccm the steel's taller and skated away <laughs> <laughs> that was it i was like oh, i wasn't going that wasn't the outcome i was looking for but whatever <laughs> that was it that was the end of it <laughs> you talk about equipment uh i don't think i've ever asked you this so that first season you were the starting goalie uh the stars had a great team you had a great team and then you get into the second round uh against the ducks and they had js Jaguar who had a great run. And the thought was, is that he was cheating by wearing pads that were too big. And your old teammate, a guy that nobody liked on that team, Claude Lemieux, um, kept calling him out on it. And everybody else danced around around it. It's 20 yeah. years later. They upset you guys in six games, including a marathon overtime game at the American Airlines Center. It's one of the most exciting games I've ever seen. But yeah, you're 20 years removed from it. Did you dare wear illegal pads? Should they have busted him on that? Hmm, that's a good one. I don't know if they were illegal then. There, I mean, there was policing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they definitely were. You know, it was his. Uh, it was his pants. That was it. it was his pants. That's right. It was his pants and his knees. And his, I mean, you couldn't shoot a marble with a bazooka through if he no. went down. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, he's still going to stop the puck and move. And he made some crazy good saves. He made got some crazy lucky saves. And when he went down, like he was, there was, there was, there was no room. I mean, I had holes and they didn't, and uh, he, he definitely did. And so my, what I refer people to is he went on to continue to play well. They played the newly expansion team, Minnesota Wild, in the conference finals, which yep. sitting at home, I'm like, <clears throat> I really like to be playing these guys right now. 
And then to go on and play the Devils in the final, I'm like, man, we had such a good team. Yeah. We would have done so well against them. I mean, you know, just attrition, healthy, whatever. But we really liked our chances. Anyway, um, he went on to win the Conn Smythe. Like, he played yeah. awesome. And so he makes you feel a little better that, you know, a few equipment things aside. But he goes to he goes to get the Conn Smythe trophy, and he can't take his glove off. Like he he takes a bit seriously. He takes his blocker hand off, but he can't take his glove. And then I've technically never seen it, so this is hearsay. But it was like tied into his upper body piece. Oh, I've heard of that one. So he couldn't take it off. He like he needed his trainer to help him take it off. And I played with Jiggy the year before in um in uh, uh Sweden in the World Championships. We were partners and. You know, I don't really bug other people's equipment. Just he, he was wearing coho stuff. I wasn't. And uh, anyway, I heard that. I'm like, yeah, I mean, you're going to get the Conn Smythe trophy. You think you'd want to drop your gloves at least, taking it from the commissioner. Uh, so, yeah. Did he have a few things? Yeah. I mean, I saw in the minors. There's a guy named Freddie Shabbat. He was the worst I've ever seen. And they even had things built into the bottom of their skates to help them push. Like, they, this guy was pushing like goalies do now before they change the skates, the VH stuff. But he had like a metal point on the edge of his cowling. So he was pushing with the metal piece, not the steel. And so we were kind of used to some French guys cheating. And it was kind of just like, all right, well, we'll try to monitor him, but we don't want to take take care of it. So, I mean, they shrunk pads over the years, blockers, shoulder pads. So in your mind, to talk about a fellow Michigan alum, Tom Brady, so when Tom Brady got accused of deflating a football by, you know, point whatever PSI so he could grip the ball a little bit better, in your mind, that's no big deal, right? No, I mean, they, they did they did it every day. Every yeah. game they got to touch the balls. Yep. They just happened to be in the playoffs when it was freezing cold. And, you know, Tom doesn't have the biggest hands I've ever seen. He doesn't have small hands either. So he just likes balls the way they allow him to do it every day. And then they're going to go give him crap one time. I don't know. I'm biased towards the guy, and he's the greatest of all time. So um, I'm pretty sure he – if you deflate some balls, I don't know, you've thrown a football, right? Sure. It's hard the, – the, 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 the tighter they are, the easier it is to throw a spiral. I mean, yeah, you got to put your hand around it, but I thought that was the dumbest thing I've ever seen in sports outside of the trapezoid. So when you played in those playoff series, uh, you got to the West Finals in like 2008, and – Leading up to that, it was always this question of, can Marty do this? Well, then you did it. You got to the West Finals, and you guys lost to a really good Detroit team, a team that was loaded, and I think you lost in six games. Even though you didn't get to the, the Stanley Cup Finals, for you personally, was that like a, a load off because you were really good in those playoffs? Yeah, it was yes and no. The year before, we went to seven in the first round. Uh, the Vancouver? Vancouver had three shutouts in the play, first That's round. Right. It's like, you know, and even that one when we lost against the Ducks that year, it was just, it was two years back to back with Lockout in between them, losing the first round in five to Colorado, Colorado that A1 caused me to shave my head because I was like, something's got to change. And I'm a goalie, <laughs> superstitious. And, um, and it's like, man, this is, you know, it's such good years and you're playing good and crap happens. I mean, I've been, you know, I've said I've been there and I've seen it happen. But and then I'll, I'll tell you what really gave me the most confidence um, to say that, you know, did make me feel vindicated after 2008 is that, you know, after the 06 loss, um, I mean, it's just shin pads and stuff went in, a couple of bad goals. But, you know, five, five games, man, that's over really fast. And you're just like, holy yeah. smokes. Oh, that, does, that series was a disaster. Nobody played well. No, just nothing went your way. And, no one's playing good. And Army came up to me. And Army, um, Doug had, you know, had tears in his eyes. He was so upset. And I was still stunned. And he's just like, listen, it's, it's not your fault. You played great. You gave us a chance, honestly. And I got some changes to, to make and some soul searching. I'll get you what you need to win. And, uh, and I mean, I was just, you know, Army and I had differences over the years, but I mean, whether that was just a good leadership move or sincere or all the above, like it, it gave me, it gave me a little more ownership in the team 
and it also gave made me feel great after a really crappy situation. And uh, so he was he, he was great to me, um, you know, despite anything else out there. And, and that was one thing that really stood out to me. And and, and um, this is like now I get a chance to talk to, you know, kids and, and business leaders and to young executives in the community. You know, we talk a lot about losses. And that's just one thing. That's one thing I haven't brought up until now that, um, you know, look back and how it shaped my career going back to the, you know, playoffs. Uh, failures and you know how they were looked at but for me to get back on the horse in the gym and get ready and help motivate my teammates and push them the next year right uh, moments like that you'll never forget for freshman year for me losing a triple overtime in the final in the semifinals of final four had a bigger impact on me than anything else in college and then you know that one conversation that Doug had with me outside the Pepsi Center in Denver um, it really really meant a lot and so that pushed me to play well in 07 and then um, play well and in, in, in 08 and give ourselves a chance. But, uh, you know, we were good. I mean, Zuby, Moro, Ribeiro, Richards, even Madonna, all, I mean, those, those guys were all hurt in that, in yeah. that championship series. It's like everybody's hurt in the playoffs, but uh, we just could not muster anything and, and they're pretty good. So uh, it, it was a good run. And um, uh Unfortunately, it was the last one, and um, but it was it was fun looking back. Kelly was, you know, pregnant with uh, her baby now, and so he's like, "Yeah, man, I was there for that one." I'm like, "Yeah, you were." Uh, according to your bio, you're uh, you're Canadian, even though uh, the old Detroit Maple Leafs coach and general manager Pat Quinn didn't know that. I always love that Pat Quinn yeah. didn't know you're Canadian. That's one of my favorite yeah. stories. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was a dis- disbelief when I was like, is he going to put on the Canadian team? Well, he's not Canadian. Idiot didn't realize that you had <laughs> yeah. gone to Michigan, but we're from, we're from Canada. Uh, our, you know, one of the, the things about Canadians is that they, that there are no jerks or, or assholes in Canada. Are there any, do you know any Canadians who are jerks or, or assholes? Uh, we, we exclude the city of Toronto. <laughs> they don't make they don't, the cut. <laughs> they only come from Toronto. I mean, you know, it's Toronto's, uh, Third largest city in North America. You, you're going to find them there, but the rest of Canada, it is an amazing country. You might find one guy in Ottawa. You know, depends on Just your take on things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, is, what, what is the best way to? Well, before I go back, uh, do you claim Justin Bieber? Yeah, we do. I think there was a time there where. You know, I don't know why Nickelback took a beat down and Bieber too, but um, yeah, Nickelback he just looked got at, killed. Yeah, just for the dumbest reasons. Oh, they yeah. all sound the same. I'm like, have you listened to the Beatles? You listen know, to like, ACDC. Yeah, like God, like, so Christ, what, what's what's their their so they're coming back for concert this summer. Anyway, uh, we take Bieber because at the end of the day, for me, you look at the talent, you look at overall picture. The guy's a he's a supreme talent. I mean. We can go to Twitter followers, you go to Cash he's made, you go to the songs he's saying. Um, I mean, he's not my cup of tea, but, you know, he's born and raised, I think, in Stratford, Ontario area. And, and he loves hockey, so I don't mind the game. Uh, you know, how would you describe a Canadian's relationship with beer? Well, we think the Ontario beer is the largest beer market in the world. Seriously? Um, beer than like so. Germany? Yeah. I mean, you know, we just, there's so many concentrated people in one small area. Um, I mean, Molson Labatt, you know, made their careers off of that stretch of highway of 401. You know, I mean, there's from Windsor through Toronto all the way to Ottawa off, off the 401, there's probably 16 million people live. And um, so for us to go into the business there kind of made sense. Also, knowing you're going into shark infested waters, but uh, we have a love affair with beer. Um, my dad drink didn't drink much beer growing up, but he didn't drink too much. But we always had beer at the house. Um, my father-in-law, you know, he had his style of beer. And, you know, after a hard working day, it's good to have one. And so Canada synonymous with a few things. And um, high octane, delicious lager beer is one of them. So, you know, you, you have a beer. Mike Magano yeah. has a beer. Yeah, uh, he had one. Had one, uh, yeah. Uh, this sounds to me like a tricky deal. I mean, it, yeah, it sounds cool and it sounds fun, but you have your own beer label. That is kind of fun and exciting, but it also sounds very difficult. Is it? Yeah. 
Oh yeah. No, it is. And I get the stink eye from Kelly once in a while. Like you guys know what you're doing. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and the reason, the reason why the question is legit, because, you know, we have aspirations of being larger than most microbrewers, craft brewers, you know, we're in Canada, we're also selling here in Texas and we're selling to Michigan and we're building plans right now to move on to Florida and smaller States in this area. So it is a big task. Um, you know, back to what you said earlier about owning it. Um, I didn't know shit about this business. I don't know. Um, I have zero experience. I mean, I played professional hockey dust 36 years old. So um, I have stories from Bob Ganey and Doug Armstrong and, and Red Berenson. I've had a lot of great people in my life. And one thing is that, um, you know, my job is really just to find good people to help this journey and uh, that want to enjoy it and to make it successful. And so we've been very fortunate so far to have a lot of good partners, uh, been a lot of good relationships that have helped me, whether directly or indirectly uh, in the business. And man, it is an eye opening deal, but, um, you know, kind of just comes down to, you know, leadership, uh, relationships and empowering people and letting them, people are smarter than you and be involved and have a piece of it and, and grow something. So the, the, the medium is the beer and the brand. Um, that part I really enjoy. Um, beer to me is a young person's game. Um, but it's also just seeing, you know, kind of what works and what doesn't work and talk about failures, man. We've, you know, we've made a few, some colossal, some small, but trying to learn as much as we can and continue to surround ourselves with, with really good people. And the one thing I did know is because, you know, COVID came along is that um, I didn't do it to, to have employees, to have staff. But when COVID came, I'll tell you, man, I felt really good that we never laid anybody off. That's you know, what's not easy. And like, you know, you're being a, productive part of society that's great and it's, yeah you know we, we run like a family business so it, it really is it's um it's been pretty cool and it's been really eye-opening <laughs> so tell, tell me uh tell me the name of it and tell me where people can get it yeah kingsville brewing is out of uh canada we're we'll probably start making it here locally uh so it'll be texas made summer of 2023 uh pending deal with a really cool co-packer um and the best First people that have been the best to me has been Tom Thumb under the Albertsons brand and Randall's um, Goody Goody and Total Wine. We're scanned at a Walmart. Um, and I think probably moving forward, someone's going to be really stalwart for us at 7 Eleven. And uh, wow. yeah, when I mean, you have know, a relationship with the stars and, and me personally, um, I'm really excited about the opportunity to work with them. They've been great. Uh, but you got to be ready. We're just not big enough. Uh, we got couple things we think we're ready but it's going to take a few months in order to get there so uh those places are awesome you know i think we'll be in probably in specs and all over the place here sooner sooner than later so we've been uh we've had some good partnerships and um you know we saw a bunch at khl ice house we're in jake's hamburgers and jake's game days growing we're in every one of their locations so we've been in over 200 places in the metroplex um some have fallen away just energy time production if you're flying out of love field stop by turco 35s and uh, there's a new beer garden in there serving an array of beers but in particular kingsville, kingsville. so yeah uh marty i really want to thank you for doing this today congratulations not only just uh, on your career but the fact that you've done so well in your post playing career i know that's not always easy and you've been a great ambassador for the dallas stars and the sport in dallas fort worth and i've never met anybody who spent any time with you who's had a bad word to say about you because you're you've been really genuine with people and you make them feel really at ease uh right away uh thanks a lot marty i really appreciate this yeah sorry some technical i don't worry issues. about it that's right that's right that's why i just play my canadian roots right there we didn't get the internet for <laughs> you relate to it <laughs> but i that's but it. i was here I, i'll tell you mac um i've always enjoyed you and you. you know you was you know you i mean you probably need to hear it too there's there's always a fine line between being in the locker room and not and having professional relationships but also calling it like it is man it was could imagine being in, in in your seat you know having to see us uh on a daily basis but you know i did i had bad games you know Ray, Ray, razor covered up a little bit for me but um 
you know, the good ones don't as they shouldn't. And that's called true professionalism. And you can always have, when you have a relationship with somebody and still be true. I mean, to me, that's the ultimate sign of being a pro and not just, doesn't just go to, to hockey. And, um, and so anyway, it's always good to hang with you. I appreciate the, the good questions. Uh, I still get nostalgic, you know, it's been right. over, over, over a decade yeah. of, of playing yeah. And, you know, speaking of Dallas, Fort Worth, the DFW area, um, we couldn't wait to get back here. Our kids are all born and raised here. This is home. And, you know, we've, we've been in the area for 22 plus years and uh, we just think the world of it. It's a very giving place. It's a fantastic people. Um, weather's usually pretty good and, uh, and it keeps you on your toes. And then, and also people are successful. They work their butts off and you want to be surrounded by people like that. And so, Working with the stars keeps me involved in the community and the game, and having uh, been an entrepreneur has uh, been amazing. So, I wouldn't want to do it anywhere else. And, uh, meeting people like you has uh, always been a treat. So, thank you for the time, my pal. All right. Thanks, Marty. Take care of yourself. I'll see you soon. Bye, Mac. Okay. See you later.